Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's Take Out the Stigma of Grief. My name is Nicole Fulmer, and I am the Director of Community Engagement at Delaware Hospice. And this afternoon, we are going to be talking about grieving as a suicide loss survivor. And I am joined uh, by some people today who will be sharing their stories. Uh, Melissa Hopley Rice, uh, she is the author of The People You Meet in Real Life, and also Don Keister from Attack Addiction. We hopefully will also be hearing from Penny Ann Rogers. I think she may just be having a little trouble getting in this morning, so hopefully she'll be joining us as well. We like to have these sessions uh, as interactive as possible. So if anyone does have any questions, uh, you can feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try to answer everything by the end of the session. So with that, Melissa, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and then for you and Don to share your stories. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having us. Um, I've been a public speaker for the past 12 years now, and I share my story, mental health recovery, and other people's stories who I've met along the way who have inspired me. And truthfully, I've learned that I used to have to hide. Um, I was afraid to be judged. I thought things that I went through defined me. And what I realized was the more we have this conversation and the more we talk and open up, the more understanding we can become and the more that conversation starts to understand that there are other people out there battling things and you are not alone and that everything you go through is valid and you may go through the same thing as someone else but the way you handle it is different and that's okay you know we shouldn't compare ourselves to this person goes through this and i went through this it's all ours and whatever you feel is absolutely valid and real and i think we need to the bottom line is to know there's help out there and there is support so I am really excited to be here, to be asked to do this by Jen. Um, it's incredible. I just met Don a minute ago and I know I'm gonna be inspired by his story. So I would love first for Don to share his story um, and then I would love to share mine after Don. So Don, would you please share your story with us? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I've done it many times. Uh, talk, to, talk to different uh, schools, groups, where whoever, whoever will listen sometimes. Um, it was December, uh, December 12th, um, 2012. Um, I got a call from uh, the hospital that uh, Tyler was, uh, Tyler was in the hospital. Um, we went there and found him on life support. Uh, he had overdosed uh, in a motel in Newcastle. Uh, he spent, uh, I guess he spent the night there. Ironically, he had asked for someone, tried to arrange a ride to get some help, um, but uh, they didn't know where he was. My son, my son Matthew spent the night looking for him. We all kind of had a bad feeling about what, what may be going on with, uh, with Tyler. Um, December 23rd, 2012, he passed away. Uh, my daughter's birthday uh, in, in February of 2013, uh, we we started attack addiction. While I was in the hospital, it it became clear to me that this story needed to be told. And I didn't really understand at that time all the stigma that goes along with uh, with these these issues of mental health. Uh, and of overdose and the things that, that occur with it. Uh, and that stigma is one of the things that we work to try to, we try to resolve. Um, he was a, uh, while he's there, I said to my, I said to my father-in-law, I said, you think it's appropriate for me to take pictures of Tyler on life support? And we agreed that it was, and we agreed that we have used those pictures uh, uh, in discussion, uh, when we talk about talk about some of the issues, and by the way, I'm a very firm believer that if we are to get by uh, this, along with the mental health issues, we got to start early. Um, and um, that's a whole other story when we come when we come to that. To that. But anyway, Tyler was a gift of life donor, uh, and um, we have we have come. We've come a long way since uh, that little group uh, met in February of 2013. Um, 
to try to try to figure out how to help others. We wanted to help others. We wanted to make them aware of what was available. We wanted to fight the stigma. Uh, we wanted to be um, a support for anyone that uh, was in was in this particular in this particular situation. Um, since then, we have uh, we have done a number of things. Um, we worked at Legislative Hall to get the 911 Good Samaritan Law passed. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's uh, it says that you can't be arrested or prosecuted if you call 911 in the hopes of relieving of helping someone who may have overdosed or may have uh, even alcohol. Um, we also worked on the on the bill to make naloxone available. Uh, worked on several things that has uh, had made naloxone available over the counter even at this point, and that's one of the things that we do. We we train. Uh, Dave Humes, one of our board members, is a licensed trainer. You know, we even train trainers, and we have a number of people that go out and and uh, train for naloxone. And when someone calls me about an issue, and I'll get those calls frequently, they they have a, a child that's in in needs help, and those stories are so sad um, to hear to hear the struggle that parents are going going through, loved ones are going through, sometimes spouses. Um, it is, uh, it's uh, hard to hear those. But uh, anyway, the naloxone, it's one of the first things I ask them is, do you have naloxone? And, you know, 80%, 80 percent of the overdose deaths occur in the home, and not very many people have naloxone. Our first responders, our police officers, a lot of them do, but uh, they need naloxone, and we will, we will train, train folks just about uh, anywhere that they need to go. Um, we have uh, developed housing. We have three houses for women and four houses for men right now. Um, our most recent was a house we opened in, in Milford in Sussex County. Uh, we're trying to get, to get ourselves down there. Originally, we did have a, uh, a chapter in Sussex County, but it's kind of it's kind of folded, but we're working on getting it, uh, getting it back back up and, and, and running again. We've also developed a real working relationship with the state police in regards to using Troop 2 for an um, uh, educational program called Reality Tour. Now, since the, uh, since the virus has been around, we haven't, we haven't uh, conducted those, those uh, programs, but we did have uh, about four years of conducting this, this Reality Tour. Uh, we asked that a child and a parent accompany that, and we talk about uh, talk about the dangers. We have people that are in recovery that come and speak. The police officers speak, and some other things, other things that uh, uh, that that do occur. One of our most recent bills that we passed was the um, uh, was a bill that would require the require the companies that built the pharmaceutical companies that have distributed that distribute these things uh, to provide an impact fee. So the state is now, we were the first uh, state in the union that, that brought, this, brought this bill out. Uh, it has not been challenged by anyone, uh, which we thought maybe it would happen. And so there's, a, there's an, impact, an impact fee that's collected. I think they've collected about um, $750,000 at this point. Uh, and it is not in the general budget. It is part of helping, helping people that, um, that are in, in recovery, um, mental health and issues that that may may be with them. So we've been we've been busy in those regards. Uh, my only hope would be that Tyler would be around to see some of this. Uh, he would he would really he would really enjoy and like uh, what we're doing. I know he would. And um, uh, I tell you, the the impact of what happened can creep up on you at any time. So. Anyway, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm anxious to anxious to hear from uh, from you, uh, Jennifer, or no, I'm sorry, Melissa. So anyway, well, first, thank you for sharing all of that. We appreciate it. Thank you for using you know your trials and tribulations to really help others. I think that's the beauty of it. And 
we've never met before. And, um, I always believe, you know, it's like the people we meet in life, um, inspire us and we can connect to them. And as you started talking, very interesting, we lost my cousin two years ago of a fentanyl overdose. Um, he was 25 and, um, I was put in charge of the opiate prevention program at Immaculata university this year. So 250 to 300 freshmen um, actually watch a documentary film I put together of my cousin story. Um, and there are videos of him on Facebook that went viral of him high on 69th street. And, you know, my aunt wanted to show that because we wanted to show that it happens and it's real. Um, and yeah, we miss them. And I guess when you were speaking, it just made me feel so connected to you. And, you know, I don't want to not, you know, lose um, touch with you after this. Now I, I want to work with you. And, you know, even after this conversation, I would love to um, work with you to support your organization and um, continue your message because I think it's incredible and amazing. And the strength you have is, is unbelievable. The fact that you lost your son and, and started the organization so soon was so beautiful. Um, it really shows so much strength um, that you have and, um, you know that his life is saving so many lives now. So we can definitely tell you that. Um, you know, we all have a story in life and I think that's the beauty of it. Um, I personally felt like I was alone. You heard, yeah, you guys probably heard my kid, um, right? You know, when we're doing this. I'm opening goldfish, I'm so sorry. It but, is um, fine. It is the beauty is, of working in the life. pandemic. Yes, it is. Um, so sorry. We can do, we can edit that out. Right. It's fine. Right. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, but we all, we all do have a story and, you know, for so long I had hid my story. I had thought that, um, I was different than everyone else and I would be judged for my story, which I was at times. And I struggled with severe obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. And I always hid behind a front and pretended everything was fine. And when I was 16, you know, going through therapists and not connecting with them and, and having people judge me um, and try to hide behind that, that external world that looked perfect. And I think a lot of us do that where we have this life that we see on Facebook and Instagram and, and out there and, and another, this is, this is great. I'm so sorry. Don't come it's here. real. This is life. This is, this is real life right now, working from home pandemic. And my husband is, is working. So um, I appreciate that, but you're doing great. <laughs> um, but truthfully, when I was, was 16, I started having thoughts that, um, I didn't matter anymore that, you know, my issues define me that I never be anyone. And I came home a day from school, a friend noticed how I was acting and she had walked into my house without permission and just went up to my room. My no one was home. And she said something to me that I always wanted to hear. And that was, um, miss, I'm here for you. Please talk to me, you know, tell me what's wrong. I'm not going to judge you. And that was the moment that I realized that I mattered that this whole time people were saying, you're a drama queen, get over it. You know, what you're going through isn't real. It literally opened my eyes to know that we all do have a story. And, um, I mattered in that moment. And as I continued to get help, I started meeting people in my life. Um, when I went to Immaculata, I spoke on a panel with others who were struggling in school with physical and mental health issues to make the school better. And as I looked at them, I'm like, why are you here? You know, you play sports, you're on back campus. It doesn't make sense. And I started to realize right there that we're everyday people, that we walk around with these faces and smiles and lives, and we don't realize the, the stories that people have and the strength people have. And Today I spoke, I spoke in a school to students and I was really struggling this morning to speak. It just was a morning that I didn't feel the inspiration. And I remember sitting there looking at the students' faces and thinking, wow, you showed up at school. You showed up with a mask on, you sat down and all the external factors affecting you at home and COVID and life that you walk around with every day and you showed up. And I said, that shows strength. And for me, it, it made me realize that I had to, no matter how I felt, you know, keep going, that I can feel the way I feel and take care of myself, but also know that um, whatever you're feeling is real and valid. Um, and, and I think, you know, grieving and, and going through things is natural and it's needed and it helps us heal. I know with my cousin, we went through a lot of the grieving stages. My parents got divorced. We went through the grieving stages. It's so healthy to feel those emotions. And I hope that everyone knows you're entitled to that. Everyone knows that you need to feel the emotions that you're feeling. Um, 
looking back, you know, you did see that I was the author of the people you meet in real life. And, you know, this book is, is not really just about me. You know, I do share my story in it, but in every chapter, I ask the question, am I alone? Do I matter? And in each chapter you meet, um, literally 30 people I've met in my life since middle school and, and since actually five years old up until college who share their stories and, and Jen on here knows so many of them. Um, there's a lot of Immaculata alumni that are in this book and truthfully it's them sharing their hardships um, and turning it into hope to let everybody know, you know, you're not alone and there is help and hope out there. So I've been speaking for 12 years and a lot of people ask me, um, you know, when are you done? How do you, how do you do it? And, and the truth is I've been burned out. I've taken off a year. I've taken off another year. Um, I've asked myself why I continue to do this, why I continue to share my story and share other stories when you have to go home and deal with the emotions. And, you know, there's one reason I do this and it's, I never want anyone to feel the way I felt. And I remember speaking at a high school in Westchester. I shared my story. It was like seven years ago. And I had the counselor write to me and um, she had shared with me that a student um, had a suicide plan and that she heard me that day and walked up to the counseling center and was able to get treatment that night. And for me, I realized that it wasn't about me. And I knew that there was a reason I shared my story because I wish I had that in high school. And I know, Dom, what you're doing. I know a lot of kids out there are, are saying, you know, or maybe adults are saying, I wish I had that, you know, in in the past. I wish I had that for my son. I wish I had that for, um, for me when I was struggling. And it's just beautiful that you're taking that negative that happened in your life and, and working to save other people's kids. And we appreciate that. And I know my aunt um, who has shared her story um, a good amount. The first time she shared it, I made her share it on um, NBC. Was it CBS? CBS three, which was so nice of me, but she's like, I'm doing it. And I just it was beautiful to me that she just wanted to share that story. So I know this is just the beginning, Don, of I think me and you connecting. Um, I'd love to share the documentary with you and, and work with you and and just, you know, try to just eliminate this so, you know, we can save any young adult that, you know, we can get to because I think we all deserve this. And we all know the sooner we get help, you know, the better things can be. And today I still battle my depression, my anxiety, but um, I have the skills, I have the tools, and I know that it's okay for me to admit that I'm struggling while I speak because I know that there is help out there. So it's not about being perfect and, and being quote unquote over everything. It's about the strength we have to continue while, you know, we, we battle things every day. So I think it's amazing. And I'm, I'm grateful that Don had shared his story. So thank you so much. Um, so did you want to do Q and A? I see earlier, Rich. Okay, so Don, um, we were asking if there were virtual tours from attack geared towards families who suspect addiction, um, who are families who are going through it. So like virtual tours on a website, you mean? So, so Don, what, um, when you spoke about the virtual tours, are they mostly geared towards, um, you know, parents or loved ones who might feel that their kid might be susceptible or might be going down this path? or the toys more geared towards um, families who are currently in the situation and trying to help um, loved ones see the light or see, see, you know, see, I don't wanna say the wrongs, but their, the path of what, what might mm -hmm. end up happening. The, re the reality tour is a preventive program uh, that, that we have. Um, so that's, <laughs> That's not quite what uh, I guess we, what um, what Melissa was asking about. Um, we do have support groups uh, that are virtual. Uh, that some are for people that have lost loved ones. We have uh, twice a week for those, and then we have one for people that are in recovery, uh, or people who have family members that are still still alive but in recovery or in using or in in recovery and. Um, Want, need a support group. So we have virtual support groups that meet uh, on a regular basis. And that information is all on our website. That's awesome. That's so great. And resources in the community are so important. Um, you know, especially your organization um, in terms of mental health, 
I speak for NAMI, um, National Alliance on Mental Illness. There's so many resources on that website as well. And I also speak for an organization called Michael's Giving Hand. And the really cool part about that program is we have an acute crisis program where we work with Thomas Jefferson University. And if there's a child struggling, um, we're able to actually get them seen by a Jefferson psychiatrist within 48 hours, which is huge because normally it's six to 12 weeks. Um, so I do love that program. And I think I wish I had it when we were younger, but I'm so grateful that we're able to do that. Um, so some things that somebody could say to someone battling addiction. Um, Don, I'd love you to answer this. I can tell you really quick, my brother is five years in recovery. He owns his own barber shop. He just bought his first house. I'm so proud of him. It's amazing to see the growth. He's now, um, he's 30. So he actually may be, yeah, he's been using since he was about 19. So five years clean, which is incredible. And um, I just remember in terms of saying something to them, it's even with people with mental illness, you know, you want to let them know that you love them and you care about them. And you know that this doesn't define them, that it's, you know, a chemical balance in their brain. And this isn't something they gave to themselves. But I think with, with addiction, it was harder because we had to play tough love and we had to just instead of me calling beds for seven hours and trying to go find my brother, we had to play that tough love and not, you know, um, enable. And that was hard because you always have that question in your head. What if, what if something happens? And that is what happened with my cousin, even though he was doing well, um, he lived in a halfway house and he overdosed in a halfway house, which to me is a joke and sad. And how could that happen when he's in that recovery place? And we just talked to him the day before and but, you know, those obviously will go unanswered and um, Narcan saved his life twice with an AED. We were able to get more time with them and, you know, and, and we're grateful for that. But I think for me, it's, it's hard to know what to say because I know you're not supposed to enable, but you also want to let them know you do love them no matter what. So Don, if you could share um, some things you can say to someone who's battling addiction, we would truly appreciate that. Well, you know, it, it is really a fine line a fine line between the enabling and the love. And I think that's one of the things that I, that Jeannie and I struggled with the most as you love your child. And I guess the commercial is true that uh, if, if love would, would, cure, uh, would cure addiction, um, there wouldn't be any uh, because parents do, do love their kids, but sometimes trying to figure out where to go and what to do. And, and at this point, I think uh, I think I'm I'm leaning a little bit more towards towards the love side and assistance side, but I don't want to call it an enabling. Right before right before Tyler passed away, he had he had um, taken money from us, and it, we really could have had him go to go to jail for it. And our you know discussion was, do we? Do we take this and, and have him put in jail or do we uh, try to deal with the situation? And we decided that we were not gonna, we're not gonna send him, send him to jail, but um, we, did, we did use a, a little bit of that requiring him to live in a, in a, a halfway house or a, or a sober living facility. Um, as I look back on it, the facility was just not the way I really wanted him to, li to live. And that's part of the reason our our facilities we try to make them as nice as we can so that people at least feel hey I'm 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 here that part's taken care of now I got to work on work on my recovery work on the things I need to do and and these people that are in recovery are phenomenal I mean you talk about five years and we have a person on our board that's thirty years uh, these, these people that make recovery they are amazing people they really are what they have to go through. And what they have to fight. So I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I say, I say, don't enable, but show them all that love. Make sure you, that you talk to them. Make sure you're around them. Make sure you converse with them. Make sure you provide things for them. Um, although often they don't give you the chance, but I think the more you can do that, I think the better off you are with trying to trying to get them to get back on the right track and and go through the go through the treatment, go through the uh, recovery situations that they really need to, they really need to do to make themselves whole again. I mean, let's face it, this disease is, is, is characterized by relapse and mm -hmm. people with cancer, people with, with diabetes, those, those people do things 
uh, that causes relapse for them. And, and this disease uh, is exactly the same. And so we, we have to realize that and we got to just continue to fight as long as we can, as hard as we can. And I, and I will say there was a, a national host on TV years ago. This was when my cousin was alive. And I remember we were watching and my aunt was so angry because um, I, I forget she was with Regis Philbin and um, Hoda, I think. Kathy, I think so. Kathy Lane. She said, well, I'm a good parent. So my kid's not going to have an addiction or something like that. And you're like, it's, it doesn't have to do with the parents. Like, look at the three, you know, of my family members. We're all raised the same and we go through different things. It doesn't just because you, you're a parent doesn't mean your child with addiction, you're a bad parent. It's, it has nothing to do with that. It's chemical imbalance. So Hadan, how would you respond to that? Because that's, it's heartbreaking to hear it, it that. Is, it's heartbreaking. And, and I see it any time that we have a meeting for parents, middle school and high school parents, hardly anyone comes. Right. Hardly anyone comes up. They just, I guess they think it's just not my kid. And anytime I speak, I say, it is anyone's kid. It's anyone's child. And you have a responsibility to talk to them. You have a responsibility to, to figure out what's going on in their lives. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a disease. And one of the things that kind of frustrates me is now I see, I, I mean, 90% of the people who become addicted started out with pot or alcohol. And now we're legalizing pot. Um, alcohol has already already been been there. And, you know, those parents have to realize that that is what will take their kid to a death situation. And I think it's hard sometimes for, for them to understand that. Our reality tour, I think, tries to point that out when they do come, when they do come to that. But when we have just, just meetings for just parents, it, they are so poorly attended. It's just, it, it, it is really amazing. But parents need to understand yeah. they have to do something. They have to be responsible and they have to make sure that their kids are okay. Absolutely, Don, thank you. Don, I have a, a question. Um, at what age, uh, maybe what is the youngest age you've had someone come through that program? Just out of curiosity. Well, the, the reality tour, uh, we, we say uh, 10, 10 okay. years old, that they can come with a parent. <laughs> it, well, go ahead. I have a 12-year-old daughter who is showing signs of this. Uh, she's adopted. She and her little brother both suffer from anxiety and depression. Um, she is labeled as bipolar. She has already started cutting herself. Um, has tried to commit suicide and has tried alcohol, has gone into a lockbox we have broken into it to take medications. And I see the pattern at 12. Would, would you, what advice would you give? Would it be to go through that program? Because I am looking for as much help as possible. Oh, and you know, she has a great support group with therapists and psych a psychiatrist and a loving family. And yet I feel lost that I can't get to her. Well. And it wasn't until hearing you speak and you, Melissa. Thank you for sharing and trusting us to share. That you know, I'm looking for help. And when you said middle school, it struck me. She is in middle school. And is, uh, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about this program, the recover, I'm sorry, what was it called again? Well, recovery? reality tour. Reality, that's it, reality. <laughs> reality tour. It's a, it's a program that, that, yeah, I'd be glad to talk a little bit about it. Um, it we, we go to troop two. And uh, we meet in the general in the general um, room that they have there. Uh, they've been very cooperative in the fact that they know that someone uh, someone <laughs> needs to be um, incarcerated for overnight or something. They they defer them somewhere else. Wow. Uh, so we have a we have a general meeting and then we go through then we go through an arrest and it's kind of interesting because a state trooper comes in with no warning, with no anything, pretending like he's arresting this person. And uh, some people are kind of taken aback as to what is actually happening here. 
Anyway, he's arrested, and then they realize that that's part of the tour. They then take him to um, they then take him to his jail cell, and go in there and have a have a some online some uh, conversation there about about that situation and about how he's using and how he how his parents don't really realize what he's doing and things like that. Then it goes to a party scene, and at the party scene, he overdoses and medics, paramedics come in and they work on him. And then the third scene is a funeral scene yeah. of him. So then, then we go back and, and we have some conversation, conversation about, about that and that situation. Um, and one of the things that most of the people like the best is that we have people in recovery speak. Uh, they come in, they tell their story, they talk about the kind of life state, the lives they lived. Um, they're great. They're high school athletes. They have good good grades at, at times, and and loving loving families. And they just get into into a situation that is just because of their maturity that they they really they really can't can't handle. And um, so I, I wish I had an answer. An answer for you to 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 make those things go, but it sounds as though this person is in a loving place with people that support her, and I think you, you're going to have to have to continue with those with those kinds of things. You've already gotten her help, and um, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I can't tell you that. Absolutely, thank you, Don. And and that is true. It is not your fault. I um I will say from somebody who has said like, oh, I've gotten help and I tried it and the talk therapy, like you hear people say, I've tried it, I've done it. Well, if you went to a hairdresser and they chopped your hair off, would you try it and be done? Or would you go to another hairdresser, right? So every therapist, psychiatrist, or psychiatrist is different. Mine did not work from eighth grade up until 16 or terrible. They made me worse. That is why I ended up in a psychiatric hospital and had to get help. As soon as I went out of that hospital, the counselor at school started working with my um, mom and found this study at UPenn. And I was able to get in the study and, and find someone who knew what they were doing. i um, working with the, the struggle I had and I was able to start getting better. So I would love to offer you and anybody out there, um, Michael's giving hand, I did Nicole send you the information. Listen, this program with top Jefferson University hospital doctors, we literally can, if the child is in an acute crisis, which it sounds like your daughter is Nicole, please call this number. The executive director will get back to you um, and be able to connect you with Jefferson. And it might just be a different path that may, may work or may anchor the other supports that they already have. So I would say every treatment is different. And if you feel one is not working, do not give up because it's not fair that um, this didn't click. And then we say, hey, I tried it. No, I promise you that if you keep trying and find that, that one that works, life will change dramatically. Um, it also is, is sad to say that if they're not ready, um, it, 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 you can't, like, I wasn't ready to receive the treatment I was, was getting, um, until I had a reality check that I wasn't alone. So any way that you can support your child by saying, you know, I am here for you. I do not understand, but I want to be there for you. I'm not judging you. I love you. You know, you don't deserve to go through this. You deserve to get better and get the help. So just things like that to support them and let them know that I may not understand what you're going through, but I love you and you're worth that help and support. And also introducing them to other people's stories like TJ's, like, like mine, you know, sharing these stories um, to let them know that what they're going through, they're not alone. Um, and, you know, they do deserve that help. So that would be my advice is to not give up and to share other people's stories as well. Um, so they do feel like they're not alone. And she may know, you know, that she's a burden or feel embarrassed or any of these things, just as I felt. And to know that one moment when someone said, no, you're not, no, you know, you matter and what you're going through matters. It just really changed my perspective. So that would be Thank my- you. Thank you both. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Melissa. Of course. It is amazing how just, you know, it was that word middle school. I'm like, oh my God, that's my daughter. And um, they say when you start conversations, it's, it's amazing um, how just things come out and, and people connect with you. And, and as I said, like, I didn't even know what Don was talking about. You know, I didn't even know you, Nicole, before this. So 
just to be able to, to share stories. And now we know more about each other than the mailman I see every day. And we've, we've been with each other for 40 minutes. And I think, I think if our world worked more like that, I think it would be so much less judgmental and, and supportive. So I hope this is a continuation of conversation that we all can have and know that we're not alone, but know that there is help out there. Most definitely. I'm just checking the chat. So do we have any other questions or? Um, I think, and we're that? right about at time. Um, if it's all right, I just would like uh, Don and Melissa, if you don't mind, just share some of the other sessions that we have for Take Out the Stigma of Grief Week. Oh, and there's another little one. <laughs> Let me just share my screen here. Sure. All right, do you see that slide? Just to make sure. Uh, so tomorrow uh, we have some sessions for Take Out the Stigma of Grief. We're gonna be talking about the loss associated with Alzheimer's and then moving on into helping children cope with the death of a grandparent. And then also um, our pets, they're so much a part of our lives. So we'll be talking about coping with the loss of a pet and then closing out the day, talking about uh, having two people actually talk about uh, the sudden loss of their loved ones who died in the line of duty and sharing their story. And then on Wednesday, let's see if I can get to Wednesday, there we go. Uh, we'll have a session on anticipatory grief. So talking about what, it, what, what to prepare for when you know that uh, one of your loved ones is going to pass perhaps on hospice care. And then another session on what I wish I knew before my loved one died, 10 ways to remember your loved one, and then talk about happily ever after divorce. There is a, a journey there and there is definitely some grief that goes along with that. And then finally on Thursday on Thanksgiving, we will have a session uh, that will include some Thanksgiving blessings. Uh, it's a difficult time of year for many, particularly in this pandemic about the people that may not be with us this year. So we'll, we'll share some tips there and, and just have some moments there to um, share stories and gratitude for what we do have. Along with take out the stigma of grief sessions that we're having, uh, the, we came up with this idea of takeout because a lot of things are related to food. So these are some of the restaurants that are donated a portion of their proceeds to Delaware Hospice this week. Uh, as part of this special week. And there's a wide assortment there, everything from uh, Sherm's Catering Thanksgiving dinners to cupcakes and uh, Frank's Liquor Store donating money for their Advent wine calendars, which I think sounds like a, a lovely idea. <laughs> And then also just to mention um, our Festival of Trees program, it kicks off the holiday season where there are some beautifully decorated trees and wreaths. Although it used to be in person this year, it is virtual. So there is a, a wonderful video on our website. We also have the opportunity for people to purchase ornaments in honor of their loved ones and an Etsy shop where uh, you can do some holiday shopping. And that is all on our website at Festival of festival, excuse me, of treesde.org. And just to let you know, uh, I should have added your information here, Don, I apologize for that. Um, but with Attack Addiction and Delaware Hospice, you know, whatever you're going through, that there is, there is hope. And, you know, I find it so interesting, Melissa, that your last name is, you know, mm -hmm. Hopely. Um, yeah. You know, it's, I'm sure you've, <laughs> you've thought about that. <laughs> Well, my daughter, we need my daughter Hope because of speaking and everything too. So I love it. Thanks. My, um, my little guy's initials. Uh, well, his name is William Tristan Fulmer. So Ooh. that tells you about his initials, W, T, and, you know, the final one. So Hilaria. Yeah. <laughs> my late husband yeah. had a lot to do with that one. <laughs> oh my gosh. So just to want to wrap up and just uh, give a special shout out and a special thanks to Wing Mom, a wonderful organization here in Newcastle County. Uh, Jen actually brought uh, the owners together with us and uh, we've all experienced grief in one form or another and it has bonded us. And they wanted to 
give back to the community. And so we came up with take out the stigma of grief. And so we have the takeout delivery, uh, we bring in food, they're having a contest, um, who's your wing mom, and then we're doing these grief sessions as well. And uh, Sherm's Catering is also a sponsor as well as Ignite Your Life. So we just want to thank them again uh, for making this possible. And always we give a shout out to our corporate sponsors who make a lot of the programs that we offer through Delaware Hospice possible. Um, as a nonprofit, we always look to our community to help us and they certainly do. So we can offer support to so many people in our community. Well, that is all for today. Um, thank you all very, very much for taking the time um, to join us today. And we will put this uh, recording out on our website and we can send you the link so you have it. And I know I will be in touch with the both of you and also through Michael's giving hand. Thank you so much for that, Melissa. I did not expect to get this much out of this session today, but uh, <laughs> clearly uh, something made me want to speak up. Um, so I'm, thank you for allowing me to, um, to be authentic and, and, and to do that and make me feel comfortable. So I do appreciate thank that. You all. Thanks for having us. And we really, we hope you guys took something out of this and um, I'm grateful to know you all. So thank you. Most thank definitely. You. Well, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, again, stay healthy, stay safe, wash your hands, social yeah. distance. So <laughs> good luck with those kids, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Take thank care. You.